Okay, uh, good afternoon, everybody. You are most welcome to our webinar on 2021. Uh, unfortunately, we still have to go through a webinar and not a real uh, meeting as uh, we did the, up to 2020, but we hope to return to the normal format in 2022. And because we are a webinar, also the, 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 the format and the size of the meeting is different from the usual presential meetings. So we have uh, Susan is always our host, uh, guest honored in, in, in presenting, um, representing Instruct, myself as uh, ITPB coordinator or CSBO coordinator. And then we will have a participation from Margarita Asher speaking about uh, the, the, our uh, participation in the Instruct with the project. Carlos Cousel will speak about his new equipment at FCUL. And we will have um, uh, one uh, student that uh, did the um, internship in the center of Finland, Andrea Fernandes, and Ugo Oliveira from Universidad de Minho. And I actually should like to hold your attention because this is the first participation of Universidad de Minho in uh, Instruct, which uh, I think is really very good. Uh, was just one uh, uh, R&D project and they will uh, very briefly speak about this, uh, this project. Um, uh, all, all the speakers will, there will be an interval of five, not an interval, but as if you look at the timings, there are five minutes between the end of each speaker and the beginning of next, so that you can put a put, um, few questions uh, um, for that speaker at, this uh, five minutes period. And uh, somehow I missed putting uh, this uh, interval after Susan's, but I think she has to leave earlier, unfortunately, than all of us. So if you want to put questions to Susan, please feel free because the timings are not fixed. We can uh, extend or uh, reduce as we go along. Uh, and so if you want to put uh, or to bring up any questions related to the instruct and uh, direct these questions to Susan, please feel free to do it after her presentation. Otherwise, uh, we will have this uh, short uh, five minutes period after each speaker. And at the end, we will have a longer session for Q&A uh, questions or debates or whatever you might want to bring up. Um, I also like to uh, call your attention uh, to the fact that the meeting is going to be recorded and available to all the participants at the end of the session by the hub. And uh, before uh, starting, I'd like to thank all the speakers for having agreed to participate and the support from the hub on, on getting these uh, distributed and announced and uh, run in parallel with ITQB now that uh, because this will be running in parallel with Renata Ramayo from ITQB as well. So we are ready to start. Susan, please. Do you see my screen? Yes, we do see your screen, but not your presentation. No, we don't see don't see the screen. Do you see it now? Uh, yes. yes, not yes, not in but the screen. Yet. Uh, and uh, it's uh, in your mode, so we're not seeing it in presentation mode. Okay. Just when this plays, yeah. How is that? Okay. Yes. That's okay. Fine. Okay. That's great. <laughs> well, well, firstly, thank you very much for inviting me um, again to your meeting. Um, it seems a long time since we, we met in person the last time. I think it's at least two years. 
Um, and so I, I hope I'll be able to show you that, that Instruct has moved on a little bit since we spoke last. Um, I'll try not to go on for too long because um, as Maria Armenia said, I do have to go to another meeting. So I'll try and keep this as, as concise as I possibly can. Uh, most of you, I think, will know a little bit about Instruct uh, and uh, because you know, it's Portugal has been a member for many years now, and uh, there have been a lot of activities uh, from Portuguese researchers using Instruct uh, services. Uh, so I'm sure that that many of you will know uh, more or less what we do. Um, so I think this slide probably is mostly redundant because I'm sure most of the audience knows what structural biology is. Um, but, but you will know, therefore, that, that uh, the technologies and techniques and methods that we use in structural biology can reveal exquisite definition uh, of cells and proteins and nucleic acids and also their context uh, to one another within a native environment. And this is not only just uh, for normal cellular processes, but clearly uh, it can also identify characteristics that, that help determine uh, disease or, or um, malfunctions in, in certain cellular processes. And obviously uh, foremost in our mind has been in the last year or so, the, the SARS-CoV-2 infection, the pandemic, uh, and structural biology has played a really important part in many of the research processes that have helped to combat that uh, pandemic. And I'll come to that a little bit later on. Um, structural biology itself, in terms of techniques, moves pretty quickly. Um, and so there are advances in instrumentation technologies all the time. And Instruct tries to keep pace with these and there's constant upgrading and additions of new technologies to our Instruct centers so that we can stay at the cutting edge and make those instruments available to uh, our um, community of users. So here is the current uh, situation that Instruct is in. We have 15 members, which is a few more than when I last spoke to you, I think. Um, the ones that have joined most recently are shown in, in red there, and they are Finland, Lithuania, and Latvia, um, red underneath the flags, that is, not on the map, um, and EMBL. Uh, and, and so this has expanded our catalogue of services and technologies that are available for access um, by adding uh, EMBL in particular and Finland too, and Latvia and Lithuania are currently um, joining without an Instruct Center, but obviously, as with Portugal, um, they will be very valuable users of our technologies. And here is the, the map showing where uh, the Instruct Centers are, and the centers are the facilities through which people can access uh, Instruct infrastructure. Uh, and again, with uh, the addition of new members, but also at some of the existing centers, we've had new um, technologies being added. Uh, so there is a, a much broader catalog of services uh, in the last two years than, than I was able to describe uh, last time I was here. Um, so we have uh, currently 11 Instruct centers uh, and together they offer 26 different facilities um, through which the services are available. And the, the access to infrastructure, the infrastructure themselves, themselves is characterized broadly into three areas. Firstly, sample preparation, and then biomolecular analysis, and, and lastly, 3D structural analysis. And together we have over 80 of these uh, services available for access. Uh, so for sample preparation, for example, uh, this can be drilled down into a number of different technology types, um, including protein production. And there we offer uh, expression in a number of expression platforms. Um, nanobody discovery is an interesting one where uh, we're able to raise nanobodies against specific 
uh, antigens of interest, and more recently, megabodies uh, are also uh, larger uh, nanobody type um, uh, proteins that are very useful actually for uh, orienting uh, membrane uh, bound proteins in certain configurations uh, that are easier for structural characterization. And then we have crystallization, uh, which is uh, preparatory to 3D structural determination using crystallography. And then in the biomolecular an analysis, there are a raft of uh, technologies here, uh, including a number of imaging technologies, but also uh, flow cytometry and SPR and ultracentrifugation, uh, a whole lot of uh, technologies that can be used to characterize proteins um, and uh, prior to uh, 3D structural characterization. Uh, and then clearly in for structural analysis, we cover the three major technologies, electron microscopy, um, NMR and um, uh, relaxometry um, resonance techniques and X-ray techniques, including um, uh, X-ray scattering. So uh, access to our infrastructure is uh, obtained through um, a proposal that you would submit to instruct for a project, a research project that you, you uh, need some of our infrastructure to help you with. Um, so it's all an online process. I'm sure you've seen this uh, many times before. Uh, you just apply online with a short research proposal, say, uh, what the, the uh, proposal is, what sort of infrastructure you want to access and where you would like to go, one of our instruct centers um, to, to get access to that infrastructure. And of course, um, when you go to, to use the instrument, um, you will, will also get um, expertise thrown in. So we always have uh, scientists at the centers available to give advice on how to do the experiment, how to collect the data, um, any user, useful suggestions as to how best uh, undertake the experiment in general terms, and then uh, some indication or, or advice on how the, the data might be analyzed or interpreted. Uh, so it's, it's a learning experience as much as um, uh, an experience of just gathering data. And uh, if your proposal is accepted uh, after scientific peer review, then, uh, and you come from an Instruct member country, then Instruct will cover the costs for you. So uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's a free uh, service at the point of access for the user in those cases. Of course, um, in the current situation, it hasn't been possible for people to travel to the facilities to access the infrastructure. Um, and so uh, many of our centers have been moving towards making access to the, to the technology uh, remote. And uh, this has been particularly driven by the, the COVID-19 pandemic and, and um, because the restrictions on travel have been so complete and it's been impossible for people to travel. But this was happening anyway. So uh, there has over the last several years been a move towards um, uh, enabling uh, access uh, remotely. Um, this has been uh, a huge benefit, not only for people who um, find it onerous to travel or you know just can't find the time but it also opens up the infrastructure to a much broader range of people who might otherwise not be able to to access it um, and it also of course makes it available to people uh, who are very long distances away from the facilities themselves and so this has enabled us to offer access to some of our instrumentation uh, to uh, users exceptionally in non-instruct member countries in other continents. So we have had a pilot um, uh, program for users in Latin America and also in South Africa, where uh, there has been limited access to some of our facilities for people in those locations uh, who, who otherwise would not be uh, able to, to visit uh, one of these facilities um, easily 
to do an experiment. So remote access has become uh, very popular and very useful. And at the moment, uh, about 64 of our services are available for remote access. So I mentioned that um, structural biology has played a, a big role in the COVID-19 pandemic. And I just wanted to highlight a few of the research outcomes that, that um, used some of the infrastructure, just to show you what has been going on. We've had uh, quite a few um, uh, success stories uh, related to, to COVID-19 uh, through our instruct centers. Uh, and these are a few of them. Um, the first one is um, from, the, ne from uh, um, the Netherlands. And um, the, the Instruct Center in the Netherlands was working with Janssen vaccines. And you will know that the spike protein um, is the major antigenic protein of the uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus. And it's, um, it's found in two configurations, so-called open and closed configurations. And it's the closed configuration that seems to elicit uh, antibodies uh, that are more powerfully um, neutralizable. So um, that is the configuration that would preferentially be an antigen of choice to raise antibodies that would, would efficiently neutralize uh, virus infection. And the, the Netherlands Center uh, expressed a protein in such a way that it was, uh, it, it was expressed as a stable uh, closed configuration uh, protein. Uh, and they did this with Janssen vaccines because clearly um, that configuration they, they were interested in, in um, including in their vaccine formulation so that uh, immunized individuals would raise antibodies that would efficiently neutralize any subsequent infection. Um, so that was one of the, the nice pieces of work that, that clearly had a structural um, component. And then um, there was some nice work done in the UK, uh, looking at um, the, the uh, spike protein again, uh, and looking at uh, the binding domain of, uh, binding domains of various antibodies um, in, uh, to, to the spike protein. So, so what happened here was that they made, they identified 377 uh, monoclonal antibodies that were derived from convalescent sera from people who had been infected with the index strain of the SARS-CoV-2. And then they mapped these monoclonal antibodies onto the spike protein structure. Um, to determine where the most potent neutralizers bound on the structure. And they found that they were fairly well aggregated around the so-called head and neck region, which was the, the, top, the, the top surface of the spike protein. But there were many other monoclonal antibodies that bound in other regions as well that also contributed to some neutralization activity. So it's very interesting to, to, to gain a full map of the, the binding diversity of these antibodies following infection uh, with uh, SARS-CoV-2. And then as the variants arrived, um, then it was very important to start to understand um, of the variants that were causing concern, um, how these would react to uh, neutralizing antibodies themselves. So the first variant that, that arose was the UK variant. It was B.1.1.7. I think it's now called the alpha variant. Um, and um, this, this protein was expressed, the spike protein was expressed from, from this variant. Um, and then uh, it was uh, um, various convalescent sera that, that had been raised from the vaccine, the index vaccine strain was tested against the variant to see if, if those mon monoclonal antibodies bound efficiently and could neutralize this variant strain. And fortunately, I think you all know the story that in fact, the, the vaccine elicited antibodies were effective against this strain. 
And the same thing has been done with the, the subsequent strains of concern, uh, the beta and the delta. So they're the ones from South Africa and India as well. And uh, the delta variant is, is slightly less well um, um, neutralized by uh, antibodies raised against the index vaccine, um, but still sufficiently so to ameliorate disease. So, so in all these cases, structural biology has been really important in uh, giving us a, an in-depth understanding of what is going on at the virus and the molecular level and the immunological level. Um, so we've had um, quite a lot of success, as I said, with, with uh, COVID-19 research. And in fact, over the last year or so, we've had uh, at least 14 publications. I think since this slide was made, there are another three. Um, so this shows that nearly all of our centres uh, in one way or another have contributed to uh, this research um, area. Um, and one of the other things that we did uh, related to, to this was um, it's, it's all um, very good to be able to access instrumentation for uh, COVID related research, but in many cases, and, and especially since um, the, the race was on really to, to achieve uh, some sort of successful result in terms of vaccine development and therapeutic development very quickly, then what we wanted to do was to help an initiative that would uh, overcome some of the barriers that, that researchers find when they, they need to express a protein of a particular type for their experiments, or they need to gain access to antibodies or other reagents, but they're not able to do that very efficiently. And so in the UK, and uh, this was broadened out to some European users as well, um, the UK set up this uh, protein portal for COVID-19 reagents and Instruct built this portal based on the ARIA system um, so that people could apply to get access to reagents, either some um, purified spike protein or any other viral protein that was available or monoclonal antibodies. Uh, there was a whole raft of protein uh, reagents that were available through the portal. Um, that were all well characterized, they were all known how they behaved, um, you got information about uh, how to store them, how to use them, uh, what the carrier protein was, and so on, uh, concentration and, and, you know, uh, nice little SDS page gel if it was a protein so that you could see its purity and so on. So this was a really useful thing because it, it, it just saves people time in not having to go through that process to reinvent the wheel uh, when these reagents were already there. And so Instruct was really proud to be able to do this um, at very short notice to, to provide this resource for the community. So aside from all of the usual um, research stuff that's been going on in the Instruct centers, we have also continued to deliver our training program. Um, so we've had a number of courses running uh, in 2020 and, and uh, into 21. Our next one is next week. Um, and that will be a training course held in Leeds University in the UK. And that will cover mass spectrometry and NMR services. Um, available there and, and new methods related to those uh, technologies as well. And then we've got a couple of others that are planned for uh, the rest of 2021, the first of which will be in Spain, uh, looking at cryo-electron tomography um, data analysis and followed by a cryo sample preparation workshop in the UK, um, but we haven't fixed a time for that just yet. And we've also been pretty active in hosting some webinars. Uh, as we've all been glued to our Zoom, then it's been very easy to, to have some informative webinars. Um, and we've had 11 uh, to date. Um, most of the Instruct Centers have hosted one of the webinars and presented two to three talks um, in each of them about this, the, the showcase science that's been going on in their center. And these have been really popular. We've had over 1,500 attendees to these webinars. 
Um, and these people have come from many, many countries outside of Europe, over 50 countries worldwide have tuned in to, to watch these webinars. So it's a nice way of um, uh, getting Instruct out there and, and getting people to understand what we do and what we can achieve using the infrastructure that we have available. Um, one of the, the most notable things that, that has affected our um, method of work uh, over the last 12 months is that everything has become virtual. I am still sitting as you speak in my own home, working from home and have been for uh, the last 18 months. Um, I guess at some stage we'll go back into the office, but uh, at the moment uh, we're still being very cautious according to the guidelines uh, in the UK at least. So we are glued to Zoom. Um, and uh, we've had so many virtual meetings, it's, um, it's becoming a little bit boring, um, but it's good to be able to continue to work. I mean, we do suffer a little bit uh, from Zoom fatigue at times, but I think this is inevitable and we're not on our own there. But at least, as I say, we've kept moving, we've kept working, and it's been really useful. We have continued our internship program, although it hasn't been possible for the inter interns in many cases to, to complete their internships um, because most of them do need a, a practical component. And, and the whole point of internships is that you become embedded in a different environment, in a different laboratory for a period of time. Uh, and that in itself is beneficial. So they're a little bit on hold, but, but they will continue as soon as we're able to open up uh, the centres for, for visits. And likewise, the, the research and development funding is, is still ongoing and we funded 10 projects, um, which are sort of small pump priming research awards um, for, for people to, to do a, a speculative or um, ambitious piece of work that might not otherwise be easy to get funding for. And this just kickstarts um, the research program that, that then perhaps could develop into something more tangible and, and successful. So these have been very popular. And in fact, in the last call, um, we were oversubscribed enormously. I think that we had 80 to 90 applications of which we could only fund 10. But what we have done is we have carried over some of the near misses, the ones that were very close to being funded, but we just didn't have funds at the time, into 2021. And uh, some of those will be funded this year. So we've tried to uh, expand this program to, to meet the demand um, at the present time. So this is just a snapshot of some of the other projects that Instruct is involved in. These are EU funded projects. Um, there's um, quite a lot of them at the moment. <laughs> so this is a lot of work to get through. The ones that we are most closely involved with is EOSC Life, um, which is the cluster project, uh, project that brings together all of the life sciences research infrastructures to, to develop workflows and tools and services related to data management arising from those research infrastructures. And of course, that is our clear um, connection with the development of the, uh, the European Open Science Cloud. Um, and there are many other projects associated with development of that, that the uh, science cloud as well that we are peripherally involved in as a result of EOSC Life. And then the other one is RIVIS. And in fact, the meeting that I need to, to go to straight after this, this talk is um, a, a symposium that we're hosting in Latin America from Campinas in Brazil. Um, and that is to engage with uh, the structural biology uh, community in Latin America uh, and, and outside of the structural community more broadly to all of the research infrastructures um, in Latin America that want connections with their counterparts in Europe. So it's, it's part, RIVIS is partly a very broad um, research infrastructure project, but it specifically uh, favors structural biology and, and we have a specific satellite uh, event in Latin America for structural biologists. Um, and 
And the others um, are uh, various um, um, in various areas of research. Transvac is vaccine research, um, and uh, and then INIX discovery, as as many of you will know, is also an access driven uh, structural biology uh, project. Um, and then the ones uh, on the right in grey text, Isadora by COVID and E Remote are three projects that we are um, uh, partners in the proposals that have been submitted to the Commission for funding um, in the, the first of the Horizon Europe calls. And Isadora and by COVID are both uh, related to uh, SARS coronavirus work. Um, and eRemote is a project that will um, promote the, uh, the development of remote and um, digital services for research infrastructures. So one of the things that Instruct is also interested in doing is establishing partnerships. And I, I mentioned a little bit about Latin America, and this is one of the partnerships that, that was a forerunner of the uh, RIVIS work that we're doing um, this week. Uh, and that is a collaboration between Instruct and a project uh, called Microbes, uh, which is run from Portugal and with uh, EU LAC Resinfra, which is an EU funded project that is coordinated from Spain. And through this, this collaboration, we were able to uh, give access to uh, Richard Garrett um, to um, uh, access the, the diamond light source synchrotron uh, infrastructure um, funded by the Micros project. And uh, they were looking at um, uh, structure of septins. Uh, and so this is just one of the um, partnerships that enabled access for somebody who is uh, very far away <laughs> and benefited from, from this um, partnership. Um, experience. So I think that's my time is up. And uh, I just wanted to thank everybody again um, for uh, joining the meeting. I hope it's a really good, I know that it will be a great meeting. They always are. And I'm so sorry that I can't stay for the full program, which I would really like to do. Um, but I hope that this has given you a snapshot of where Instruct is at the moment. Um, we're in good shape, I think. We've come through the COVID crisis pretty well. We're still all on deck. We haven't lost anybody. <laughs> and uh, we're looking forward to the next few years. Um, and I'm sure that, that uh, we will continue to expand our services. So please have a look at our full catalogue. Um, you can uh, access any of our services through the website. Uh, or if you have any questions, then don't hesitate to contact us at any time and ask a question. We're always there to help you as much as we can. So thank you again. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Susan. It's always good to know, and especially I think uh, uh, having an overview of uh, what the Instruct uh, has gone through during this crisis was really very helpful. And also the contributions for, for in terms of the scientific contributions for the, for the, 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 the coming up with some solutions. Uh, I, I'd like to, I don't see any questions here. Uh, uh, so, yeah, okay, I don't see any questions here, but I'd like maybe uh, people like to hear a, a bit uh, which are the technologies which are more requested in terms of access uh, for the various centers. And uh, also, if you have any idea when, um, operation will become uh, usual or open or to, 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 to visitors, or if this will be done gradually uh, according to the policies of the different countries, or in total, I, I don't know if uh, there are answers to these questions, but <laughs> nevertheless, maybe, <laughs> maybe people like to, to know, know a little bit about that. And yeah, but... uh, okay, we, uh, there is another one, but uh, we'll come to, to that in a while. Okay, so so in terms of the the technologies that are requested, I think um, everybody knows that the cryo EM is is the the technique of the moment. So um, we do have a lot of um, demand for for 
access to the, the, the EMs. But we have increased the number that we have available um, over the years with, with um, EMBL joining as a member. They, they bring in the new uh, imaging center at Heidelberg that has a number of very um, uh, high specificity machines, very high resolution EMs. Um, and also we added uh, the, the um, infrastructure in, in Leeds in the UK, which, which added a number of, of cryos machines to, to the facility in the UK. So we're increasing the number all the time, but it continues to be pretty highly demanded. Um, I suppose the other thing that has consistent high demand, and this has always surprised me a little bit, is protein production, sample yes. preparation. And that seems to be quite limiting in some cases. And people may have um, the, the machines to do very specific structural characterization, but they may not have on site the ability to make their own proteins and characterize them and purify them and so on. So, so that continues to be a very important part of, of the services that we provide. Um, in terms of opening up those services and getting away from, from the Zoom and, and the remote access, um, I think we're going to have to follow the, the national guidelines in each of the countries where we have centres. So um, it might be country by country, something like that? I think it will be. It will be a combination of, of you know, if, if somebody wanted to go from, from Spain to the Netherlands, it would have to be dependent upon travel restrictions in Spain in leaving the country and coming back <clears> and having to, to go through quarantine. And also in the Netherlands, you know, whether they are able to enter and stay and so on. So it's going to be quite difficult. I'm sure it will be quite slow and gradual in the first instance, but we were all hoping that we could get back to normal before the end of this year. And we'll just have to wait and see what happens with the variants and the, the onset of winter and so on. It's, it is still very uncertain um, how that's going mm -hmm. to pan out. And that's why we're still very keen to, to develop the remote services so that yeah. we can... We can uh, actually, actually yeah, Andrea was uh, lucky enough to have <laughs> her internship in Finland. And Finland uh, was one of the few countries that could receive the, and not so much development of the COVID. So she had the presential internship in, in December yes. before the, the big wave came on, but then nevertheless. Yeah. Okay, uh, are there any more questions? Uh, no, if not, I just like to ask another one. For the new variants, um, do you foresee any further contribution from instruct from structural biology centers uh, coming along or uh, is this still very much um, um, being done at the moment or uh, it, it's it's still or is secret uh, yeah. It, no <laughs> it's still yeah. ongoing and uh, you know as the as the variants um, come up they're characterized firstly as sequence variants but it's very difficult actually to uh, identify which of these sequence variants are going to be the ones to cause concern in yeah. terms of population transmission and, and infection um, just by sequencing alone. I mean, that's not possible. You yeah. also need to have no. a better, more in-depth understanding of where those mutations are and whether they're likely to, to evade uh, an immune response or potentiate uh, symptoms. So that's where structural biology is still quite important to, to map those uh, mutations as they come along and identify whether they're in regions that we know are going to be hotspots for um, uh, immune evasion, for example. So this is happening all the time. Uh, and, and also, of course, there are um, big efforts going on to modify the vaccines accordingly to be more effective against some of the variants that are arising. Uh, so again, structural biology is involved there as well. I think it's going to be a constant uh, trickle of, of yeah. Uh, yeah. analysis of these variants as we go along. Um, for, for Yes, and uh, mainly if the virus persists, which is likely 
Yes. Yes. Uh, I have a question here from Sally Roman who is asking, I'd like to obtain more information on the microbes project and the role of instruct in this project. Yeah. And I don't know if you want to, to say something. Or well, I, I, I would say um, maybe contact Margarita, who is, who is the microbes person. I think we've lost you. Marie. Yes, yes, I'm, I'm on and off. Margarita can tell us a bit more when she speaks, I suppose, on, on, on her um, participation. Okay, I don't think I have any more questions for you, Susan. Thank you very much. Okay. Good well, luck for you. your next meeting. Yes, and, thank uh, you. We were very happy to have you here again. <laughs> and, thank you. Uh, okay. Enjoy the meeting. Okay, thank, thank you very much. We hope next year we'll be in. I forgot to say it at the beginning. It will be the first time at, out of ITQB, but we hope to have it next year. At least we are planning to do it if uh, the crisis or the virus allows us <laughs> by May or June or July next next year, 2022. Okay, thank you very much, Just Susan. Bye. <laughs> yes, thank you. Yes. Okay, uh, it is my turn now. Let me take out uh, the, the um, uh, uh, so I am the coordinator of CSB, as I mentioned already, and most of the Portuguese people know about it. And CSB um, uh, is the Portuguese affiliate center to instruct. And uh, yeah, I guess that most of you know it, but the, the, our fee was sponsored by FCT during five years and then by consortium by these various uh, institutions and universities for two years. But fortunately, again, since 2020, where we had FCT back again with a commitment for four, four years. And uh, PSIS bio such as Instruct uh, aims at structural biology, including all these methodologies mentioned in the slide. You have the new site for PSIS bio down in this bottom. And so if you want to follow activities at PSIS bio, which uh, the site is kept by um, and Luisa, uh, in, and Luisa in, um, Carvalho from FCT UNL. UNL. Uh, as uh, for the, the, the instruct itself, it, it first had the preparatory phase, then an operational phase that was run by Instruct Academic Service Limited uh, from the University of Oxford, Oxford between 2011 and 2017. And then from 17 onwards, uh, uh, Instruct was um, uh, given the Eric or uh, achieved the Eric st status, and Portugal was one of the funding members uh, as um, uh, the Eric stat uh, Instruct Eric. And uh, through our fee, all the any Portuguese scientists from any institution can apply to the various schools or various activities of Instruct. I suppose that you are all aware of that, but nevertheless, it's always important to stress it. Uh, the Portuguese involvement in, and success in Instruct compared to uh, considering our, um, the size of our um, research community is quite um, reasonable and good in some cases. Uh, we have 383 registered members and one affiliation, affiliated center, as I mentioned already. Uh, research and uh, grants, five awarded on a total of 35. And as Susan mentioned, this is a very, very competitive activity of Instruct. But uh, well, we have five on a total of 35 not counting with the, the, the new one from Gulliveira because 
<clears throat> this data is from 2020, as indicated here, only. And then uh, uh, no, up to the end of 2020, um, is total data for all the Portuguese participation in Instruct. We had eight courses funded on a total of 63 and 10 internships on a total of 38. This is where I think our success is the highest. And in terms of access proposals, we had 60 out of 810. These are total numbers. So I think we should invest on that as well. <clears throat> uh, on um, the research grants uh, were um, won by the first one by Afonso Duarte and Manuela Pereira from ITQB, and the second one by Bruno Almeida from University of Oporto. The third, on the third call from Margarida Asher from ITQB Nova. The fourth call, Hugo Fraga from the University of Oporto, and if I'm not wrong, from the Faculty of Medicine. Margarita Asher again, and now uh, Hugo Oliveira, and is not counted on the five because it has been granted and will start only in 2021. Training courses, we had uh, eight as indicated uh, yeah, here. Uh, and uh, they were run since 2012 up to 2018. And since the remote mode for training courses has started, uh, uh, there was no application yet to the training program. And I think this is a pity because I see many of these workshops with the running more or less in a similar way as if they were presential. So, you are all most welcome to apply to instruct to training courses. Internships, uh, we had uh, um, 10, as I indicated, Ana Sofia Lorenzo, uh, Daniel Moutinho and Pedro Souza, with affiliations indicated there and the place where they went to, Rajesh uh, from ITQB to UK, Sara Silva on the second call, Sandra Angel, on the third call, Marcia, Marcia Alves and Joana Cristóvão. Joana Cristóvão again on the fourth call, Yoga Taid and Andrea Fernandes that in spite of the COVID crisis went to Instruct Center in Finland last December. And she will tell us about the, her history uh, in Finland in a while. But there are, I want to call your attention to other projects and initiatives related with Instruct, uh, where the Portuguese community has been involved and Portugal has been involved. And uh, I will start by, uh, the I mentioned it already, the participation in, um, uh, in the Instruct Ultra project. I think we was one of the partners of this project, which has just finished. And mainly on work page, uh, work um, program four. Margarita will talk more extensively about this uh, project and what um, we gained from it. And uh, within this uh, call, uh, there was a, a proposal submitted by Margarita and Jose Maria to expand cryo microscopy to Latin American countries. And as a follow-up of this proposal, this application was submitted by, to CTED in April 2018. And the thematic network uh, was on one world, one health, in integrative approaches in structural biology and cryo-electron microscopy. Margarita and Jose Maria are coordinators of 11, 11 groups from various Latin American countries. And you will see here a, a slightly more detailed description of what is CITED is and what kind of organization CITED is. But as I said, maybe they will speak more extensively about this. And uh, uh, the other action within, um, which is related with Instruct that uh, has been um, uh, worn and funded by Portuguese uh, researchers is um, 
EU uh, twinning project that was submitted and uh, um, positively evaluated and is already running. The coordinators are Pedro Matias and Sally Roman from ITQB. And the idea of this project is to build knowledge on cryo-electron microscopy methodologies at ITQB Nova. So this is the main mission. And to, uh, um, to, to achieve this, they have uh, gathered, uh, as we will see, um, uh, centers, instruct centers from other countries. And the main activities of this um, project are workshops, exchange visits, seminars, visits to ITQB experts, and development of soft, soft skills uh, or for earlier career researchers, and also outreach activities. Uh, unfortunately, most of these activities up to now have to be done through webinars or remotely, remotely but we hope before the end of the program, which will be 2023, uh, that this can be presential because it's it, very good and essential. So here we have the other centers that uh, are part of this consortium, of the IMPACT consortium. We have uh, Spain, Jose Maria Carazzo again, uh, on for development of new image processing methods for electron microscopy. And they have pioneered some of the work for this methodology. Finland is one of the new centers, the newest centers within Instruct uh, on uh, special, specialized in characterization of micro molecular complexes and nanoparticles using single particle analysis cryo EM. And Weizmann, both the, these three are Instruct centers. Uh, more related with electron tomography and uh, the two key persons are, um, I have this uh, closed I like, and I cannot, no, sorry. Um, my, Mikael Elbaum and Sharon Wolf. Um, there was a, a um, kickoff meeting of, uh, this impact consortium, fortunately this was presidential and we have uh, these um, responsibles for these centers in Portugal at the beginning of the project, but uh, now is also um, all done remotely. Uh, the other, the other um, uh, action and um, that, uh, or activity that I would like to, to call your attention to maybe most of the Portuguese researchers know about it already, but is uh, the possibility of uh, having cryo EM or cryo uh, TEM uh, running equipment in Portugal. Um, uh, uh, to that purpose, um, uh, Portuguese nas national infrastructure uh, proposal, uh, uh, proposal was submitted uh, to create a network for health and life sciences with these uh, partners, as indicated here, and the proposal was to get the uh, funds for this um, equipment had to be submitted outside the Lisbon area, so it was submitted in, for CCDF uh, the north, and fortunately it was um, approved so uh, a call will be launched soon to the purchase of 200 kV cryotem uh, as soon as possible. And it is also hoped that a call for a national instruct, uh, national infrastructures in the uh, roadmap will be launched so that if successful, this proposal, and when it happens, the funds will be available for all these centers to implement uh, more effectively this methodology other than just in the central node in Braga at INL. Uh, I, I forgot to say, but I think it was mentioned before, this initiative was also, um, was also um, headed by Pedro Matias and Celia Roman. Uh, there, are, there are also 
two other um, proposals which uh, were important at the beginning of this year. And these proposals were for to have instruct sites uh, in Portugal. Instruct sites are um, something that uh, was created for the, to, to be uh, um, uh, kind of involvement with instruct between having no center and having a center. So an instruct site will be mainly um, used for training activities or will mainly have to provide training activities and uh, will be um, uh, entitled to do so in a very effective way if approved. And uh, there are two proposals from Portugal, one from ITGV Nova, um, involving several methodologies on instructional biology from X-ray structural determination, NMR, protein production, biophysic methodologies. And this was submitted by Maria Asher. So it was, it's a wide proposal in terms of methods. While uh, a proposal from Carlos Crudel is a more focused proposal in native uh, MS on uh, new method, uh, equipment that has been uh, running uh, since a few years ago at uh, EUL uh, Portugal, Lisbon. And um, I would like to finish by acknowledging all members of the ITQVMX unit for participating and giving suggestions to this presentation and Portuguese participation on Instruct. Carlos Cordeiro has always been very supportive of all these webinars and seminars. And Ana Luisa Carvalho uh, by running the Precision View site and uh, ITQB Nova for helping promoting and to running this webinar, Renata Ramayo, and uh, Instruct, um, Instruct Hub, uh, John, um, uh, that is also as set it up in the Instruct Ed web and uh, was very helpful on setting this webinar running and going. And thank you for your attention. If you have any uh, question, feel free. If not, I don't see anyone asking any question. So uh, in that case, I will give the word to uh, Magrida Asher, who will tell us about the accomplishments within Instruct Ultra. Okay, thank you, uh, Maria Armenia. So I will talk a little bit about the accomplishments that uh, uh, we have achieved within uh, um, uh, our project in Instruct Ultra. So I'm the head of the Membrane Protein Crystallography Lab and part of the Macromolecular Crystallography Unit at uh, ITKB uh, Nova. So um, basically, Instruct Ultra. Um, uh, was was uh, funded and uh, its um, aim was to release the full potential of Instruct and expand and consolidate the infra the um, Instruct infrastructure services for integrated structural biology within the uh, uh, life uh, science community, and so our. Um, <clears throat> ITKB uh, uh, was involved in two working packages. One was uh, uh, streaming lining access procedures for pioneering structural biology methods. So um, as you can see, uh, uh, there were different methodologies involving NMR, cryo-EM, nanobody development, and also membrane protein technologies. And uh, um, the working package leader was Darren Hart, and then the partners involved in the membrane protein uh, technologies development was uh, Instruct uh, 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 from the University of Oxford and uh, uh, ITKB Nova. And so um, here our goal was to uh, establish procedures for uh, protein production 
now using either uh, mammalian cells. And this was done at the University of Oxford uh, and supervised by Ray Owens. And then also expression of membrane protein in insect cells, which was uh, uh, developed by then Jupp van der Hoffel by the Helmut, uh, um, by the Helmut Center in Germany. And then um, our goal here at ITKB was then to uh, develop the expression of membrane proteins in uh, uh, E. coli. And so we have done so using then uh, around uh, 100 uh, uh, um, genes from uh, Mycobacterium, which were involved in the cell wall synthesis. And uh, um, so a, a procedure was done to do some high throughput screening uh, for the membrane uh, protein production. And uh, this was done by uh, uh, Jose Rodriguez. And I'm missing here the, uh, sorry, the photo from Vanessa Almeida. And so I will not go into details, but then it's about transforming. So the, so these one, uh, 100 genes from different families um, a different mycobacterium uh, uh, species was selected, then genes were amplified, cloning, transformed in different uh, uh, E. coli strains, and then the, the, there was this high throughput expression screening using small amount of uh, growth medium, and then the best targets were selected for larger scale production. And then it involves going uh, from gene then to uh, uh, um, purified protein. So using uh, uh, an eco uh, NTA affinity uh, um, purification. So the work was, uh, this work was recently published uh, in uh, processes and, uh, uh, and the other ones are ongoing also on the eukaryotic expression on, in eukaryotic hosts. So uh, also then following the protein uh, uh, production, we in a consortium which was uh, coordinated by Filippo Mancia from the Columbia University at New York. Um, and then Yang Zi was a, also a very talented uh, PhD student, along then with all the work developed by um, Ana Luisa Rosario and José Rodríguez, the PhD student at ITKB. Then um, the structure of uh, one of these uh, glycosyl transferases, AFTD, was published in uh, molecular cell. Uh, there were several interesting uh, uh, features that came out with the structure. I am then not going into details regarding the, the scientific part of this uh, um, this structure, which uh, uh, made the the cover image of uh, of the molecular cell. Then also along uh, uh, this 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 characterization by cryo EM another structure of uh, uh, EMB, so another glycosyl transferase was published. And so this is important also to monitor uh, uh, where uh, the mutations are that lead, that confer resistance to uh, uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis. And, uh, um, and so most of the most prevalent mutations are located around the active site. And so ongoing studies now are also uh, uh, um, moving forward to also um, go for new drug developments. And then uh, we now also have uh, 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 at ITKB, um, we are also, so Jose Rodriguez is also working with the uh, AFTA target, which is a smaller protein. The other are around 150 KD or 120. So they are above the minimum for, to go for uh, cryo-EM characterization. This protein is too small. And so Jose Rodriguez attended a nanobody a workshop uh, which was uh, uh, promoted by Instruct at uh, uh, Brussels. And um, so nanobodies were produced against this protein. So um, SPR studies are also underway to evaluate the affinity between protein and uh, uh, nanobodies. Then also in one of the best uh, 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 um, nanobody uh, or the one that seems to be the best, then megabodies were produced, so bigger 
uh, uh, um, the, the nanobodies so that uh, they bind to the protein and then you have uh, um, enough size to, uh, uh, to, 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 to perform cryo-EM. And so preliminary data is also uh, have already been collected. And so this is in collaboration with, again, with uh, New York. And then more recently, and uh, um, also promoted by uh, uh, IMPACT, um, then uh, also a uh, collaboration was established with Helsinki University um, via Sarah Butcher. Then the other working package in Instra Ultra that we participated was um, had the aim to enrich and expand access providing uh, uh, services. And so a call was launched <clears throat> for the partners. And uh, as Maria Armenia already mentioned, um, so uh, Jose Maria and uh, uh, myself, we have um, submitted a proposal where uh, um, the idea was to expand the access to user communities outside existing uh, intern instruct membership from both academia and industry. And uh, uh, so our new user community was from Latin America. And so, um, so, uh, uh, so here it was basically using uh, 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 structural biology, but focus on cryo EM and then to establish bridges between Latin America and Europe. So we have uh, submitted a proposal um, uh, coordinated by ITKB and CSIC, and then of course with, uh, uh, with the involvement of Campinas Brazil, where the new uh, where um, Synchrotron is, and then also the Cryo EM facility has just also been established. And so, along with this, um, CITED, um, which is basically um, a, a program to um, fund, to, to submit, uh, um, sorry, to promote interactions between Latin Ibero-American countries. And so we, I have submitted a proposal which was uh, um, called One World, One Health. And so it was by using integrative approaches in structural biology and cryo-EM to health-related projects. So here, this network integrates, integrates 11 groups from uh, different uh, um, countries and uh, uh, from Instruct partners, we have then uh, Portugal and Spain. And then um, our uh, goal is then, uh, um, as I was mentioning, to use several uh, uh, structural biologies, me methodologies, also then to uh, 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 strengthen the cryo EM microscopy knowledge, which is the most recent uh, technology, and then using a, a, a health related project and then to achieve uh, uh, um, different, uh, different programs. Um, so some are uh, working on drug development, biomarkers, uh, vaccines, and, uh, and so on. So, um, uh, uh, now, also in collaboration then uh, uh, with Instruct, um, a new call was launched uh, in May uh, 2019, and uh, uh, there were already ongoing um, uh, contacts uh, with uh, uh, several Latin American institutions and universities, mostly uh, then mediated by um, Alberto Poggiarni and uh, um, helped also from Jose Maria Carasso, Claudia Amaro. And so basically where microbes could help was to uh, uh, fund the, uh, um, the proposals that have been submitted by the different partners uh, uh, to instruct. So the scientific part was uh, the call and the scientific part was uh, um, evaluated, organized by Instruct, and then the proposals that have been successful uh, uh, have been funded 
to allow human uh, uh, mobility for the researchers from Latin America to go to the uh, EU centers. So um, more than that, now uh, uh, we are also, well, now last year it was a, 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 a pause year because uh, this is mainly about uh, human mobility. So in uh, uh, COVID times, um, it is difficult to go ahead with this. So we already had, uh, uh, fortunately, we managed to do our kickoff meeting in 2019 here at uh, in Wires at ITKB. And it was uh, uh, really good. Um, Claudia, uh, uh, Claudia Amaro and Alberto from uh, Instruct Center um, in France, from Strasbourg, uh, from Strasbourg, were present, and uh, uh, so this project aims to um, to fund uh, uh, training, to fund uh, exchange visits between partners, and uh, um, and also then to make the bridge between Latin American and Mercosur uh, countries and uh, uh, Europe and vice versa. So eventually people from EU could also uh, uh, measure uh, uh, data at uh, uh, Campinas uh, once everything is well established. So I would just in my last slide would like then to acknowledge uh, um, all the people involved in this project. So none of these would have been possible without the involvement of the uh, uh, different members of the um, uh, MPX or the membrane protein uh, crystallography group at ITTV. And then uh, just to see that things come on one way and then somehow they develop. So uh, by, 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 by having this funding from the Instruct Uter, we were able to develop this membrane protein production pipeline. Um, to access new community, to establish new collaborations, and then to attend uh, previously this workshop on the nanobodies in Belgium. Um, then uh, 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 following up this protein production and uh, uh, cryo-EM structures have been established and the ongoing work is available at, uh, 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 with AFTA, as I have previously mentioned. And here we have our American collaborators which were crucial for all, also the process of learning um, on this new methodology. Then uh, through IMPACT now, we have now also connections which, uh, 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 with Sarah Butcher and uh, uh, at Helsinki University. And actually Diogo has uh, uh, also was awarded with an intern, instruct internship to uh, 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 study, uh, to do um, studies on Zika virus uh, particles and proteins. And uh, actually then the internship will uh, uh, include visits to Helsinki University and then to CECIC Madrid to learn on EM processing uh, 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 the data. And we had been able to also uh, um, been awarded with an instruct R&D project on the Zika virus. And this uh, uh, um, includes then our collaborators from Fiocruz Brazil. And uh, they are also then partners on the uh, um, microbes uh, 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 projects and uh, uh, also with uh, Jose Maria Carasso. So we have submitted recently an FCPT project. Um, somehow some of these uh, uh, instruct access proposals or these uh, uh, um, data collections are also uh, uh, supported by INEX Discovery. Um, we have this FCT project for this uh, membrane protein with these glycosyl transferases. Now recently, this Iberian bag uh, on cryo-EM, uh, Portugal is also part of it. Uh, so the cryo-EM in Portugal has been uh, boosted uh, strongly by Pedro Matias and Celia Romão, as Maria Armeni already mentioned. And uh, so we are now uh, uh, establishing also a collaboration with Carlos Cordeiro on MS data analysis, because there are still many questions uh, regarding the uh, um, 
the, 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 the mechanism and the uh, mode of actions of these proteins. And uh, um, as also Maria Armenia mentioned, then ITTV uh, and uh, um, uh, school, so the University of Lisbon, we have submitted projects to become instructor research sites. So what I think it's uh, neat on, on this slide and what it highlights is that you start with one thing and then somehow you interconnect it with many other things uh, and this just boosts the research forward uh, uh, allows some funding for the for the students also the 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 the, the, the um, uh, mobility i think it's very important that uh, uh, we get to and especially in portugal that we are sometimes we do not have all the equipment we need, all the techniques that would, we are important to advance on our research or on the PhD uh, uh, um, work of the students. And so within uh, 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 Instruct, with the help of INX, now also with this uh, European Impact Twinning Project, uh, everything uh, uh, helps in keeping moving and uh, um, achieving results that otherwise would not have been possible. So I, I'm really grateful to many of these identities for their funding and support. And uh, I, think, I think that's it. <laughs> uh, thank you, Mar Margarita, very much. Um, it was very uh, um, informative. One thing I didn't mention, but I will add it now, the, the, um, the instruct site applications have been submitted the um, beginning of this year, sometime I don't remember the deadline. Nevertheless, they are now presently under review and will be um, um, as far as I know, there were on total four applications. So we submitted two, half of the total. Uh, they will be reviewed and will be um, evaluated by the executive committee and later on by the Instruct Council. Uh, I suppose that they will come to the Instruct Council approval the next meeting in October. Uh, and by then we will know the result, hopefully. Uh, I don't see any question, but I'd like to ask one thing because it always intrigued me. The nano bodies normally are already rather large uh, compared sometimes with the size of the protein which uh, they attach to. The mega bodies, <laughs> as far as I am aware, sometimes are even bigger. In your case, the case you mentioned, uh, what is the size of the megabody used in comparison with the size of the protein? Because this is something intriguing in terms of um, uh, altering or modifying the structure of the protein, but people tend to use these methods more and more. Well, so nanobodies can be used for different purposes. They can be used, for instance, to help stabilizing the protein that may be useful for, for instance, crystallizing it or enhancing its crystallizability. Um, so some people use it as, uh, and now we see it also on the SARS-CoV-2, that uh, if you have uh, uh, nanobodies uh, attached to specific uh, places of the uh, spike or other protein, it may hinder some, uh, um, instance, the connection between uh, 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 the IC2 receptor and then the, the spike. So anyway, so there are uh, um, many applications, medical yeah. medicinal applications yeah. Yeah. for us. We were trying the nanobodies uh, uh, eventually with two uh, uh, aims, but on the structural biology, so on the structural characterization. One was to see whether it would help in the crystallization of membrane proteins, which are always challenging. And these proteins are not very stable. And then the other was because this protein is around seven kilodalton, it's too small just to go for cryo-EM directly. And in this case, we, uh, 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 um, so the, the, me the mega body, how, how many daltons? So the nanobody is between 15, 20 kD. Mm -hmm. Uh, so if it has several sites, then you would achieve the, the, the minimum uh, 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 mass. 
but then once you have a good nanobody or what it's considered a good nanobody because you 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 select several families different families and then you have to go through and see whether they bind and uh, whether some bind stronger than others and then once you select a better what it seems to be a better one then uh, 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 they can add a scaffold protein meaning that they will add then um, more uh, 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 mass to the nanobody. And that is what it's called the, the mm -hmm. megabody. So we have one around 50 and then the, the other around 100 KD. And so uh, 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 we are now working with that because with this we would achieve it. But they have a link also then the megabody. So uh, it should bind on the nanobody and then add this scaffold protein to uh, uh, increase its size. Okay, I don't know if anyone wants to have more information about the Micros project, but I think you mentioned already most of the details, so if there is, I don't see That's any other the, where. Microbes, it's autonomous in it, uh, 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 the partners promoting the exchange, scientific, uh, 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 and also uh, uh, training and uh, uh, mobility exchange visits between the partners. And then in addition, then it was also then decided to uh, 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 bridge, make bridges or help making bridges because Instruct is also making bridges. And so the idea is that you have the various and Susan also mentioned with now these uh, 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 research infrastructure, these, uh, um, so that uh, uh, it would help uh, uh, exchanges and interactions between both communities. Okay, thank you, Margarita. Thank you very much for doing all this work and keeping these uh, these projects going on on behalf of the community and on behalf of the instruct. And now we have uh, Carlos Cordeiro from the Faculty of Science and the University of Lisbon, who will tell us about magnetic resonance mass spectrometry for structural research at uh, his faculty. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to be here. My special thanks for the uh, invitation, especially to Maria Armenia that has been the driving force of the Portuguese participation of, of Portugal in Instrut, and also to Susan, I would say, another uh, driving leading force at uh, Instrut in, in Europe. So without further ado, Okay, thank you. So, magnetic resonance mass spectrometry, national resource for instructoric. So, this is a special type of mass spectrometer. We could say it has its origins in the 30s at Berkeley, California, where people start working about uh, particle accelerators, so cyclotrons. This would be what we would call an ion source and an intense magnetic field where ions would spin and accelerate, gaining energy. So, this could be used to probe into the structure of matter. And at this stage, people were interested in the, the physics of transuranium elements. But also someone realized that there is a relationship between the mass to charge ratio of an ion and the cyclotron frequency. So this means a cyclotron can be used to measure M over Z and as such mass. There are two types of magnetic resonance spectrometers. One, of course, NMR, nuclear magnetic resonance, and the so-called FTICR, Fourier transform ion cyclotron resonance mass spectrometer that we may simply call by magnetic resonance spectrometer. They both follow, in principle, the, the general physics, but they operate under different physical principles. In our case, we actually work with an ion trap. So our ions are trapped in a region of space where we can excite them and measure the transient of an induced current, the feed. And the longer we measure this transient, the better our resolution. So commercially available instruments range from 4.7 Tesla to 21 Tesla. Only two 21 Tesla instruments exist in the world. 18 Tesla is about to be commissioned for France. It's a technical possibility. It takes about 36 months to prepare. And hopefully one will also come to Portugal in the framework of the Portuguese mass spectrometry network if we are successful. Nevertheless, 
shield is much uh, less important in FDICR than it is in NMR because uh, the world record in terms of resolution was actually achieved at only seven tesla. There are other factors. And if you look at the ion trap, and I brought one with me, so this is the so-called infinity cell. It's an old one, but you can see, if you look through here, that you have access to the trap, you have access to the ions. You can play with lasers, you can manipulate the ions. And the whole electronics plays a very significant role in the overall performance of the instrument. So this is the path of development that we intend to, to follow. And what can we do with this type of instruments? Basically two things. One is to transform very complex spectra into biochemical information. So this is an yeast extract. Thousands of peaks are found here. You could not see this and you could not identify more than maybe 2000 components if you use a 1.2 gigahertz um, FTI, uh, NMR. Uh, not to mention that we can do this with less than one microliter of cell culture. So sensitivity here plays a very important role. And out of all these peaks, out of all this mess, we can see patterns. And these patterns are actually the isotopic distributions of the elements. So until recently, you could see the isotopic distribution of carbon. It's very well separated, about one Dalton. But if you want to see other isotopes, for example, if you want to see nitrogen 15 or sulfur, you need to be able to resolve mass differences below millidalton. And this only now has become possible in the full broadband scale. So we can immediately transform this spectrum in a collection of chemical formulas. And then through database search, we can assign structures or use other methods for research. But another interesting application of this type of uh, resonance spectrometers is in structural biology. So if you have, say, a protein, protein behaves in a different way. The protein produces a charged state distribution, and you can infer the mass simply by resolving this equation, because if this ion is of m over z, the one that precedes it has another charge, plus one, and in this case, minus one charge. So you can instantly calculate the molecular mass of your protein. And if you have enough resolution, then you can see the isotopic structure of a protein. This can tell you if the protein has sulfur, how many sulfurs there are in the protein. So without doing anything, without even sequencing, you can already gain a lot of information. And you can start picking into the heterogeneity of all proteins. This is a recombinant protein, but even so, you can clearly detect the presence of other forms. Another main advantage of this type of technique is the dynamic range. So you can simultaneously measure species that differ orders of magnitude in terms of concentration. If you look at this region of the spectrum, you see there is some kind of noise here. But if you enhance this noise, you see a specific isotopic pattern. And this is characteristic of a molecule that has iron. And actually, this is the M, MB. So without knowing what this is, if this came to my lab, simple mass spectra would tell me a few things, the mass of the protein, that this is most likely a cytochrome. The low amount of heme found in the spectra, because this was done in the nurturing condition, tells me that most likely the heme is covalently bound to the protein. And moreover, the protein is very much homogeneous, but still contains a few contaminants or modified forms. This type of instrumentation also has the richest uh, plethora of um, fragmentation methods. And this is important if you want to access sequence. Traditionally, you would break the protein with proteases, the so-called um, bottom-up approach. So you dissociate your protein into peptides, sequence, and assemble. Of course, there is a scrambling because all proteoforms, all different protein molecules will be mixed in the form of peptides. And this is very critical if you want to identify post-structural modifications, for example, or even to browse into the heterogeneity of your, uh, of your molecule. And the type of method that you use to fragment is also very critical if you want to fragment the protein intact in the gas phase without further separation, except in the gas phase, of course, and without using enzymes and adding excessive complexity. So traditionally, you use CID, collision-induced dissociation, but on, an M, on a magnetic resonance mass spectrometer, you can use a lot more techniques like SORI, um, RECID lasers, uh, UV lasers, RMPD laser, and even more interesting, electron transfer dissociation methods. In this case, polycations from proteins are irradiated in the gas phase with the electrons and they break 
extensively. This is possibly the best method to actually access the entire sequence. Even on a small protein like this one, you can see that if you use classic methods available on all mass spectrometers, you get at best 50% sequence coverage. If you use electron capture dissociation, you get almost complete sequence coverage. Moreover, you can combine both methods. You can excite your proteins with the laser and then apply electron capture dissociation for complete characterization. Moreover, you can play with your ions. You can say, I want to work with this charge state, or better yet, I want to work with this modified form. So you get rid of all the others in the gas phase. No chromatographic separations, no mess, no fuss, just two proteins in the gas phase. So the magnetic resonance uh, laboratory has mainly three lines of, uh, of activity. One is related to instrument development, particularly if we are interested in native mass spectrometry, the way we take our ions, protein ions and complexes from solution to the gas phase is very important. You cannot use traditional methods like uh, uh, electrospray ionization. So normally you use the so-called nanospray ionization. But even so, nanospray ionization is difficult to implement. And uh, most uh, commercial vendors, they only produce sources that are good to couple to LC systems. So in this case, for maximum sensitivity and better spectral quality, you need to use the so-called static sources, where you apply one or two microliters of sample. And this is enough to obtain, say, 20 minutes to half an hour spray, where you can do all of the things that we have been talking about. As I said before, magnetic field is very important, of course. Double the magnetic field, you have double the resolution, theoretically. But there are other ways, especially signal processing. If you work in absorption mode instead of uh, magnitude mode, you get double resolution and enhanced dynamic range for free. It's only software, computational processing of signals. And there are other methods, for example, n omega detection schemes. So usually, detection of, uh, of signals is made at omega frequencies. But if you do at 2 omega, you can get double the uh, resolution for the same amount of time or the same resolution in half the time, which is good. We are impatient people. We like to have results right uh, right away. In terms of structural activities, of course, we apply what we are developing in terms of uh, complex dynamics of protein association, dissociation. It's interesting to understand binding energies, our protein bind a small molecule, our protein bind another one. What is the stability of the complex? How you can fragment in the gas phase and understand if you need greater collision energy, lower collision energy. How tight is the binding? How can you disturb this? Is it reversible? Then combine this with computer, computational methods to infer kinetic and other uh, parameters related to this uh, interaction. Recently, of course, we could not escape research on, uh, on SARS-CoV-2. And of course, we focused on the spike protein and, uh, and some, of its, uh, some of its variants. And finally, a very important area of activity is, of course, training. We are involved in training since the beginning of, uh, I would say, of mass spectrometry, and, uh, at least this type of advanced form of mass spectrometry by creating special courses, both for uh, undergraduate students, master students, and PhD programs, so at all levels, from fundamentals to more advanced techniques. But we have been involved in a considerable number of international courses, including native mass spectrometry. We started this around 2016. We bought our first FTICR in 2005, I think. So uh, it takes a little bit uh, of time to, to get used to it and to be able to use it. To its full to its full power, and um, recently we have done other, other courses very much specialized on this technique because of its, uh, I would say, speciality and uh, uh, rarity. Training is not easy to get. There are about two hundred of these mass spectrometers in the world on different configurations. I would say, I dare say, there are no two identical. The cell I showed you, for example. The serial number is 80, 82. So in 2005, Brooker had sold 82 instruments. So the last one that I got, serial number was 182. Maybe a coincidence, but it means that in 15 years, they sold a little bit more instruments. Not many, 100. So that's not much. And not all of these instruments are working. In Europe, there are maybe 20 instruments operational. And um, of this, um, I would say not all are the, the most advanced type. Of the most advanced type, like we have in Lisbon, maybe around 50 in the entire world. So we have less of these instruments than there are cryoelectric microscopes or 
NMRs or other instruments for structural for structural biology. And what can we do with this? Just a brief overview of some results. For example, it's important to understand the stoichiometry of metal binding to, to protein. And sometimes it's not easy either to get a good structure because in this case we are working with the tau protein. So I don't think we could get a decent uh, structure of this either by cryo EM or by, by X-ray crystallography. And uh, it's not easy at the same time to say how many calcium ions are bound, how many zinc ions are bound. But if you weight your protein in the gas phase, you can see that on the apple protein there is nothing, just a molecular mass. So it's amazing how you have this so complex spectrum that can transform this on just one single mass. So the protein is very homogeneous, maybe a small, irrelevant and modified form, but uh, we, couldn't, uh, we couldn't resolve. Add some calcium, and you can see that the stoichiometry of binding is one to one. But if you add zinc, you see the stoichiometry is completely different. You have a mixture of things that bond one, two, three, four, maybe five zinc ions. And all this is important for the aggregation pathways of this protein. This is work of uh, one of my team members, Margarida. So this started with the, with a challenge. Some time ago in Israel, at the Weizmann Institute, Michael Sharon discovered that if proteins were being overexpressed in bacteria, if she sprayed an extract directly into the gas phase, then she could analyze complexes in the gas phase without sample preparation. And this is very attractive because imagine what you could do with this. You could do control quality of what you're preparing in terms of recombinant proteins, but most importantly, imagine you do co-expression of proteins. Then you can investigate the uh, stoichiometry of binding or whether your proteins bind or not at all. So you can use this as an experimental system to investigate all these questions. And again, this is important to have, in this case, isotopic resolution. Of course, you have sharp state distribution. Spectrum quality varies a, a bit. And I can tell you that these spectra are not processed at all. This is raw data, absolutely. We rarely do any kind of smoothing or post-processing. And uh, in this case, the fact that you have isotopic resolution means that you can calculate the mass with a very high accuracy. How accurate? About one Dalton. So we could tell if the protein has a system, if it's oxidative or not, for example. And uh, a lot of information can be gained just from this. We can say that our protein, for example, forms a dimer. We had previously determined the structure of this protein by classic crystallography and it actually appeared like um, a dimer of dimers. Could it be an eczema or something else? But if we look at the gas phase, the stablest, the stablest form is the dimer. So we deeply believe that the dimeric form is the one prevalent in solution. Now, SARS-CoV-2 proteins are a huge challenge for mass spectrometry, not because of their mass, even on FTSCR, we can go up to one megadalton. And in this case, the spike protein is about half of that. But these proteins are incredibly heterogeneous and are highly modified, hugely heavily glycosylated. And although you have this beautiful uh, structure determined by cryo -EM, I don't see the glycans. So the glycans are there. And uh, of course, there is a distribution of glycans. And you see that distribution when you look at the two main forms in solution. So this would be the monomeric form and the trimeric form. And what we are doing is uh, researching into ways to disturb the trimeric uh, form of the, of the spike. Instead of going after vaccine, perhaps we want to go after therapeutic option, things that uh, work. And if we actually disrupt the trimer, maybe we are in the right way. And you can see here the uh, student that is very hard at work, Maria Nour, in this case, she's loading nanoletro spray sample. Because of the challenge, we started by doing this on the modified uh, QTOF instrument. Um, and also because of the scarcity of this protein, so we have to use, uh, to use it very sparingly. Now, because it's very difficult to work with the spike and we haven't yet resolved charge states, let alone as a topic distribution, we start working with something smaller, like the uh, spike uh, um, receptor binding domain. So in this case, we can clearly see uh, dimer of, uh, of dimers, charge state resolved. So we hope in the near future to actually isotopically resolve this. And then we can do all kinds of studies like interaction relays, which we already, we already tried. Even more interesting interaction with the different variants that are coming. And uh, this can be done very quickly as a screening tool. So collecting the mass spectra like this, once we have optimized all conditions, 
it's usually a matter of minutes. And data processing, although relatively complex, it's not uh, uh, that uh, uh, that that tricky. So it can be it can be done. So spectral deconvolution is not a, a tremendously hard task if you have resolution, if you have asymptotic resolution, or if you have sharp state resolution. If you don't have, it's a little bit more tricky, like you can see, like you can see here. So in this case, we are working with minute amount of proteins, and this could be a good uh, test bed, for example, to test interactions of antibodies with this kind of, of proteins. As I said, for FTSCR, our estimated limit is about 1 million, and that would be for Growell, which is about 800. But for acute off, the limit is much higher. I think uh, our tech managed to investigate the viral capsid with about 8 megadaltons, and the limit is estimated to be at around 12, 14 megadaltons, and we are way, way below, below this. So we are in the right spot for the highest possible resolution. As I said, magnetic resonance mass spectrometers are rarer than cryo electron microscopes and other, and other instruments. And although they do not offer uh, atomic coordinates like other techniques, they do offer a lot in terms of information that can be obtained quickly and with very low amounts of material. So I would say that uh, involved in Instruct, we have only three such instruments. Two are already integrated in Instruct Center. So this would be the Instruct Center Finland and the Instruct Center in the Czech Republic. Although they are of higher field, so theoretically they can achieve slightly higher um, I would say figures in marriage than the seven Tesla. The electronics is basically the, the same. And we work very closely together, especially with the, with the Czech Center for the development of, um, of, new, of new, new line sources. So as you can see, you have Finland here, the Czech Republic, and also one of these instruments in, in Portugal. Until recently, it was the only one in, uh, in the Iberian Peninsula. I know there was one commission for, for Spain, I'm not sure if it's already installed and uh, at field and working. All these things can take months because these are very complex instruments to set up, let alone to operate at its full potential. I know Latvia also acquired one, but I'm not sure if it's already working, uh, working or, or not. So maybe in the future we have more of these instruments in uh, in uh, in instructs. So for training, we organized the first advanced user school for FTSCI. So what this means is that people are trained in several applications, small molecules, extreme tuning, um, for not for the resolution that comes in the leaflets uh, that the manufacturer gives you when you, you want to buy one of these machines, but what you can achieve with proper training. Gas phase chemistry, gas phase ion molecule reactions, and of course, a very important part dedicated to protein to the core of life, native mass spectrometry, top-down, and analysis of post transnational modification. These courses are immensely popular. We open one of these courses and uh, we are already in overbooking in less than 15 minutes. This has happened with the old sites in the European Fourier Transform Mass Spectrometry Consortium. So we even have a situation where a course has not yet opened, but the fact that people know that it's going to open, uh, contacts that exceed the number of uh, positions uh, have already been made. So it's very competitive to enter into these courses, but the rewards are, are be great because you get the level of training that you cannot get anywhere else in the in the world and the the reason for our success basically it's a combination both of lab training classroom training we take the classroom to the lab or the lab to the classroom so this is very good for for students and as you can see for an advanced school on a very specialized uh, uh, technique we have a quite considerable number of people and of course we also have an interesting social program to, to help us out. So the next one is going to be, again, in Lisbon for top-down. So this is the analysis of post transnational modifications by impact protein analysis in the gas phase. So this will be by me, by Peter O'Connor, which is a researcher. It's a type of person that can build from scratch an FTSCR. Petr Novak from the Czech Republic, the Instrument Center, and Roman Zurev, which is one of the researchers that invented electron capture dissociation. And later on, we will have a special meeting, uh, hopefully, because this has been postponed for about two years. Hopefully, in 2022, we will finally have it in Brisbane. Of course, we are involved in many activities, but I would like just to say the Consortium for Top Down Proteomics. The kickoff meeting was actually in, in Portugal, in, in Cascais, the European 
uh, Fourier transform ion cyclotron network. And of course, we are also part of the COVID-19 mass spectrometry coalition that aims to use mass spectrometry to mitigate the effects of the pandemic by providing methods, tools, and expertise to deal mainly, of course, with viral, with viral proteins. This initiative kicked off in England, but it's uh, worldwide. And uh, among the highlights are several projects that I've been running, including uh, new diagnostic techniques, uh, protein sequencing for rapid identification of uh, relevant uh, for uh, relevant strains, and uh, and so on. And I could not uh, end without uh, a very special acknowledge to to my team. Of course, the people that work on on native mass spectrometry at the moment are not that much. It's basically myself, Marta, and uh, uh, Maria and, and Mariana. Most other people work on metabolomics and small molecules, and also involved in uh, computer uh, analysis uh, software development. Naturally, Elena Florencia, the head of the Portuguese uh, mass spectrometry network, and without whom there would be no mass spectrometry in Portugal, as well as this, I would say, honorary team member, which is uh, Carlos Sarkis Gulbenkian. So, Carlos Sarkis Gulbenkian, as you may know the story, he uh, resided in Portugal and he donated its substantial fortune to a foundation, the Carlos Gulbenkian Foundation. So this funds several events, cultural, scientific, and so on. And in the late 60s, it was the uh, Carlos Gulbenkian Foundation that actually paid for the first mass spectrometry in Portugal, uh, MSP from AI, if I'm, not, if I'm not mistaken. So I'd like to thank you all for your attention, and I'm open to your, uh, to your questions. Thank you, Carlos, very much. Uh, oh, what happened? The image went out. Okay. It's, it's back. back. Yeah, yes. <laughs> um, uh, I don't see any question here, but uh, I, I would like to ask you something. If, if you become an instruct site, uh, you mentioned already the training courses that you are developing that are very much um, overbooked and uh, always uh, 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 much attended. Uh, well, first, how, how many how many people do you have per course? For the for an, for an advanced, so for an advanced school, we had foreseen about twenty, but in the end, we got fifty. Okay. But do, of you course, have, do you have? Uh, our uh, course is small, between ten and twenty people. But we open yeah. up to twenty people. We divide them into two groups or four groups, depending, and we we train we train like that. So the idea of becoming an instructor sense for training is, is very attractive, because this would allow us to to divulge this very specific uh, mass spectrometry technique in a specialized way for for structural for structural studies, because the other training we offer is more, uh, I would say, it's more diverse, it's a little bit more universal mm -hmm. and involves most of the researches within the European consortium, except for some topic like this one on top-down proteomics that involves people that are already at, uh, at, at Instagram. Of course, it would be very interesting also to run these courses in associated with the other uh, groups that can provide a, a, a more integrative view and the fact that mass spectrometry by itself, it's not uh, enough to solve a structure. It's very helpful. And of course, it provides also something that it's difficult to obtain by other techniques like the dynamics. For example, hydrogen deuterium exchange requires very high resolution and fragmentation methods that do not provide scrambling. Electron capture dissociation is the only method that can be used for, for that. So that would be that would be interesting. And of yeah. course, we, we intend to work side by side with the uh, part yes. of the other proposal, as we already did yeah, in the past, that's the idea. in the yeah. present, and hopefully we'll do in the, in the future, of course. Yeah, but uh, I see that you also have practicals in the, the training courses, and how are you intending to open the, the instrument to users in the future? Not probably uh, right now, but uh, what is the plan? Uh, the plan basically, the operation of the instrument is very similar to an NMR, so it's basically involves post program that for the user, um, it's relatively easy to understand because it comes to an interface. If the user wants, he can program the system like he's working with on a computer program, but it can do on, a, on an interface. And we have done that, with, uh, I would say, with, uh, with some success. We work with small groups and we demonstrate 
different techniques. For example, how to tune the instrument for sensitivity, how to tune the instrument for extreme resolution, how to tune the instrument for optimizing fragmentation, for example. So all this is done with small groups with one instruction. Okay. Usually myself or other member of the consortium or uh, other members from, from my team. And then we work with three, four, four, four members. Of course, due to the pandemics, we did suspend some of the activities. Our last course happened in August last year in the, in the Czech Republic. And this course I'm going to run in October. Depends on the situation, but uh, I plan to run it in a mixed way, if that is possible. Mm -hmm. That means people that can attend, either because they are already in the country or because they are allowed to travel, they can come and they will be here. Uh, others that enroll and that cannot attend, of course, they will be away. In this case, training will have to be done with, uh, with remote tools for operating the instrument. So two things that we are developing in this European project is basically this. On one side, to give access to all tools that are needed to process the raw data from a remote location. So and this is important for collaborators yes. or uh, visitors. We can send the samples, data is collected, and then can be processed directly on our servers or in the consortium servers by tools that we develop. And the other, of course, are tools that provide an interface to the, to the instrument. Okay. It's very difficult to do it by a remote desktop because yeah. you cannot have a, a large lag if you are tuning an instrument in, in real life. So this involves a lot of development, data compression, and, and so on, so that we can do it as fast as, as we can. But this is how, how we plan to, 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 to run it. Um, okay, I think uh, all the participants are still there, but uh, they don't uh, uh, come up with any questions. They have been very silent and then they continue to be silent. Anyway, so we will move to the, the next speaker. Thank you, Carlos, very much. And now uh, we will pleasure. have uh, Andrea Fernandes telling us about what she learned in Helsinki on her internship last uh, December, or October to December, as far as I remember. Uh, it was from September to November last year. Uh, so first, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'd like to, uh, thanks for the invitation for to be part of this webinar. You I have think to put it, it, it in the uh, in, uh, in presentation screen. mode, yes, yes, yes. But you are seeing already my presentation, I believe. Yes, sorry for me. So, as Professor Marmin said, today I will talk, uh, show the work that I've been doing related to my three months internship uh, in the University of Helsinki uh, in the group of Sarah Butcher. So, uh, this internship was within the seven internship program of Instruct. Uh, it helped me to work on one of the objectives of my PhD. The objective is the structure determination of denococcus radiodurans, DNA polymerase one, and also uh, the structure of the protein in complex with DNA by using cryo em single particle analysis. Um, so uh, next slides, I will explain why I'm interested in this protein and explain a little bit about my PhD. So the main aim of my PhD is deciphering molecular mechanisms of M processing in basic excision repair. Basic excision repair, it's um, one of the most important um, pathways for the repair of DNA. In this case, for the repair of DNA molecules with damaged bases. So um, overall, the most important enzymes involved in the pathway are DNA glucosylases that initiate all the process by removing this damaged page uh, base and then AP endonucleases make the incision here in the next strand. And I'm focused and more interested in DNA polymerases, their role, and DNA ligases in this um, pathway. So I mentioned last steps of the pathway where there is introduction of the correct nucleotides by polymerases, and in the end, the complete repair of the DNA molecule by nick sealing due to the ligase that catalyzes the formation of phosphodiester bonds. So um, we 
I want to understand these mechanisms uh, in specifically with more interest in bacteria and our model organism is Deinococcus radiodurans. This bacterium contains all the genes for the enzymes that I've described previously. And not only that, it's extremely tolerant to DNA damage uh, caused by extreme conditions. It's a quite resistant um, bacterium. Um, it's a uh, resistance to high doses of radiation, some mutagens and desiccation. Uh, but it's so far that the bacteria with more resistance to high doses of radiations. So it's known for colon the bacterium. So this nickname, is, it's not just a funny nickname, but also shows how peculiar this bacterium is. And I'm interested in the DNA polymerases and ligases of this bacterium. Uh, specifically, I'm interested in DNA polymerase one. DNA polymerase X, so because these polymerases are known to uh, have a function in DNA repair. And from the two DNA ligases that the Denococcus uh, has, uh, the ligase A is the potential of the enzyme involved in the basic excision repair, because uh, ligase B doesn't contain the function necessary for the final step of the pathway. So as I said, I'm in interested in these three enzymes from Denococcus. I've been doing the cloning, protein expression, and purification to obtain recombinant proteins for analyzing their activity. And I also want to analyze their structure um, to understand the relationship to the with DNA repair. So one structure is already known. The structure of DNA polymerase X already solved in 2009. And I want to obtain the structure for both ligase A and polymerase 1. So the aim is to use X-ray crystallography for uh, ligase A. And from because it's the, from these three is the biggest uh, enzyme uh, using cryo-electron microscopy to determine the structure of uh, polymerase 1. So Polymerase 1, uh, now on I will just abbreviate and say Pol1. Um, it's a multifunction protein. So, so far it's known that in vitro, the enzyme shows DNA polymerase, uh, strain displacement, lesion bypass, 5' prime exonuclease, flip nuclease gap and other than junction endonuclease activities. And also it's um, enzyme with different domains, uh, three, so the N-terminal domain, the first one, uh, it's known to have to show a five prime exoplase activity. Domain two is considered um, a three prime exoplase domain and domain three, the one with the nucleolase activity. So by convention, it's considered that these enzymes are a form, forms two fragments, a small fragment and then a larger fragment that is known as phenol fragment. As I can see here in this figure, phenol fragment contains domain two and three. So it contains the DNA polymerase activity. And usually most studies about DNA polymerase one are about just this clenal fragment. So as I said, uh, the aim is to obtain its structure. Um, our initial uh, strategy was to use X-ray crystallography. It has been challenging to obtain crystals with this enzyme. And here I'm just showing a table that with the list of all structures solved with this technique. And I, I think it's not a really very big table, but uh, just to mention the first structure determined was from the full length and also the clenal fragment for Thermo aquaticus uh, bacterium. So I'm not surprised that maybe why this was the first structure because this uh, enzyme is the TAC polymerase, polymerase. So it's a quite important um, enzyme in molecular biology because in the 80s it's become a key component of PCR. Uh, and I also want to just point out also the determination of the structure of the clenal fragment of E. coli, because just by curiosity, E. coli was the first DNA polymerase discovered. And because of the importance of this discovered, uh, Kornberg was awarded a Nobel Prize. But we can see that after the uh, end of 90s, there is few new structures. Uh, the last structure salt was in 2020. Um, because uh, 
Well, uh, polymerase is a 102 kilodaltons protein. It's a monomeric protein. It's in the limit size considered recommended to work with quite electron microscopy, but we became interested to use this technique because one limitation of working with these kind of considered small proteins for cryo-EM is the low signal to, uh, signal to noise ratio, so the low contrast in the images of the molecules. But uh, cryo-EM and metallogies uh, related to cryo-EM are all the time advancing. There is new technologies for certain preparation for control ice thickness, data collections, usually to work with these uh, low contrast images. Con by convention, adjusting defocus is uh, a strategy, but there is also new technology as faceplate, and of course, new algorithms for data processing. And just by curiosity to show that Crayon is becoming more and more promising is uh, that a structure of a really small uh, molecule, not a protein, of 40 kilodaltons was solved with cry, by cry EM. So it's a technique to in, very interesting in structural biology. Uh, but now on, I will start about my uh, internship. So I went to the University of Helsinki, but before starting there, my, uh, my visit, of course, I had to prepare the sample. And then I started to learn in Helsinki the sample preparation for EM, uh, so I did the um, closely charge of grids, then the vitrification of my sample. Also prepared grids for loading in the microscope. And then I learned how to do the grid screening. So in this case, it's called Atlas screening. So it's a collection of in low magnification that then we can uh, see the all grid and that way assess all grids loaded and to, assess the quality of the ice and select best grid. Then just one grid will be used for data collection. Then this data collection is performed at high magnification in the microscope. In my uh, internship, I also uh, started to do the data processing of the data collections and data sets that I got with my protein, but uh, it's a still a uh, step. Uh, I'm still, now that I arrived to Portugal, still working on uh, and processing data. So in the next slides, I will show some results about these different steps that I have been describing. So um, as a final step for the purification of my protein, I did a size exclusion chromatography. Usually it's recommended to use this step uh, because the, like in the other structural biology methodologies, cry it's important to purify to homogeneity our protein. Gel filtration helps to analyze this, uh, to analyze the homogeneity of the sample. But of course, there are other techniques to complement information after gel filtration. I did stability says it's important to know how stable our protein is. So I've used thermofluorosays. This is a thermal shift stability assays, uh, allow us to determine the melting temperature based on the shift of this curve. Uh, that is the plot of, uh, in this case, fluorescent versus temperature um, by performing different experiments, such as for buffer screening. Uh, we uh, have noticed it so that the protein is more thermostable in a pH range from 6 to 6.5. It's more happier in phosphate buffers, but as I said before, our first option was to work with prior EM, um, sorry, X-ray crystallography and we, our option was another buffer. So I'm being storing uh, uh, in Vistris propane pH 6.5. And in the buffer I had uh, some salt, 150 millimolar of sodium chloride. Uh, we can also add other additives for stability, but for instance, glycerol, it's not recommended for carrion, it uh, decreases. Um, the contrast of the sample. So uh, I've been storing and the next uh, results I've been showing, usually I'm working with pole one in this buffer. So also it's important to know if the protein is active or not. For my protein, I have analyzing the five prime exonuclease activity. With this activity, the protein is able to degrade DNA from the five prime. 
So in this assay, I have done the reaction and then the reaction meat was loaded on gel. So in this area page, gel, what we see is the products obtained of the reaction, but we am um, just seeing this uh, labeled DNA strand. Just by example, I'm showing this gel, but I have done another uh, uh, conditions to assess uh, and to understand firstly how to inhibit this uh, activity. So we can see here that uh, without any salt, there is more degradation of DNA. So we have more active five prime exonuclease activity that decreases with increasing ionic strength. Um, I also, because I, as I said, I also want to, to try to obtain a structure of the pole one with DNA. So just to assess the binding of DNA to the protein. And because it's a protein that degrades DNA, uh, the option was here to analyze, use um, an assay to also see directly on gel uh, what is happening. So I have really used a letter for radic and mobility ship GSA. We can see here the formation of the complex of protein DNA comparing here with negative control. As I said, uh, I've used the, the buffer that I described previously without adding the cofactor to avoid activity. Here in this gel, it is clear if the magnesium, the cofactor is added, uh, there is degradation. Um, although we know that in a PHC 12.5, it's a condition that inhibits uh, this five prime exonuclease activity. Anyway, um, next I will talk about the two data collections, which results I will do present today. One data collection is only what the uh, enzyme and the other uh, data collection, the sample was prepared by incubating with a double strand DNA, uh, pol one uh, by incubating two minutes on ice. So both data collections that I will present today were uh, with the microscope Talas Artica, so with 200K of air energy. So they both have the same pixel size, 0 0.97 Armstrongs. And the strategy for trying to increase the contrast in both cases was the high defocus. And as I said in the previous uh, slide, for the sample where we had DNA, we didn't uh, add uh, magnesium to the buffer, but uh, for the sample preparation only with the polymerase, we had the cofactor to have an active protein. So now starting, ah, so in my internship, and I'm still learning because it's uh, is to use CryoSpark and Sapien. These are two um, programs that can be used for data processing of the data sets of CryoEM. Uh, but today I will just show the results with CryoSpark. So first I will, sorry, I will show the results with polymerase one, only with the protein in solution. With this small data set, it will collect 94 uh, movies. Uh, so it's not a really big data set. I was able to obtain uh, a model of the protein so by combining different methods of picking, manual and template picking, I was able to extract more than 70,000 particles. And in a 2D classification, usually this step to declassification is a step for analyzing the quality of our data. And also could be used as a cleaning step for removing particles that we consider that they are not good. So I, have selected these 10 classes I'm showing here. Um, these two first classes are good. The other ones we can see a little bit of noise. Usually it's not ideal, but uh, it's clearly they show the pole one in different project, projections or different views of the protein. And with the particles from these 10 classes, then I decided to do the 3D reconstruction. In CryoSpark, the 3D reconstruction usually starts with ab initio reconstructions. These, uh, I decided as first to try to obtain two models and do then a third genus refinement to see if there was some uh, uh, heterogeneity samples or different confirmations, but with only 12,000 particles, I didn't obtain really good uh, models. So by using all the particles in one model, 
after two steps of refinement, I obtained in, in this uh, model with 8.2 uh, Armstrongs of resolution. I'm showing now this model and um, I'm also showing this is an output automatically from CryoSpark. This is the FCS curve obtained. So it's the um, Fourier shelf correlation uh, that in this case give the estimation for the, the resolution. But uh, what I want to show here in this slide is the dimensions. So I was able then to see the dimensions of this model. So in length, it's hard to read, but it's 85. Armstrong's in length and here 88 Armstrong's. And now comparing this model with a model that I obtained by prediction by using homology, the Swiss model program, where I used uh, the only known uh, structure of uh, full length polymerase one from bacteria. In this case, is the TAC polymerase DNA, the uh, DNA polymerase. We can see here the prediction of the model of the structure of protein. It's a little bit different, it's a more extended conformation. Uh, but we, I'm seeing here this cleft, usually this cleft on the C-terminal domain of protein is a fixture common to DNA polymerases. I decided to overlap both models, the model obtained with CryoSpark, this gray map, with uh, the predicted uh, homology model and we can see the, the differences between the two conformations or at least two shapes. So it's kind of new information to obtain this model for polymerase all one from the uh, We have here a more compact and or more closed conformation that uh, in the beginning I was expecting. Um, so it, this is, was a, a small data set, so for future we and to improve the resolution of the model and to really have a, a structured information of the, the, um, the protein is what the aim is to obtain a bigger data set and you know because it's with more particles it will be important to obtain a bigger a, a better resolution sorry uh, we already have the data bigger data sets and now i'm doing in the, the data processing part of that next i will show uh, the results obtained with the data collection now with pollen incubated with double strand DNA. So here the data set is bigger, so it's more than 1000 movies. In the beginning, I tried to use the same strategy for data processing, so the same workflow that I explained in the previous slide, but I had really difficult to separate good particles from junk particles and to obtain a good 2D classification. So the better results I've got were using block picking. It's an automatic method for picking particles and by tuning some parameters of this uh, picking, I picked uh, uh, more than um, 86,000 particles. Did just uh, one step of to declassification for just cleaning some junk and then use a 3D reconstruction, 3D reconstruction um, jobs, uh, ab initio reconstruction, and then refinement as a step for separating good particles from particles that were uh, adding noise or were not considered good for the modeling. So I did, uh, I tried using ab initio reconstruction obtaining three uh, volumes, so three different 3D classes. By, use, by seeing the model, uh, the initial volume, it was not clear for me uh, the, and comparing with the previous model obtained. So what I have did uh, uh, with each uh, group of particles in each of the classes, I did a 2D classification and what was clear by doing that, that first class obtained from the initial reconstruction that the particles uh, resemble the, the declassification of the, the previous data that I haven't shown. Although we have some noise and for instance, in these two classes, there is a here some kind of diffusion. So with these more than 50,000 particles, I did homogeneous and then heterogeneous refinement. In the heterogeneous refinement, I have used 
referencing models. One of them was the model obtained in the previous data. And by that, uh, not many particles were separated, but I was able to separate particles, more than 6,000 particles to obtain a, a similar model comparing to the previous one, but with uh, not really be, uh, good um, resolution, 12.2 Armstrongs. Here I'm just comparing both models. So this yellow model corresponds to the model of the sample prepared with Pol1 and DNA. Uh, of course, the resolutions are different in both models, but more or less we can see that it's, they resemble both of them, even overlapping. What it is interesting in, in this yellow model, so the Pol1 with DNA, we can see here that something is nearby to protein and I believe that is the DNA. What I was expecting is to see a different volume in this uh, model that was indicating the binding of the DNA in the protein. Well, by overlapping both structures, the uh, clearly conformational, conformational change, or at least this extension that is here in the cleft, but I don't believe this is the binding of DNA. So I believe what I am showing is two models uh, of the pole one not bound to DNA. So this difficult of separating input classes from the junk classes in this uh, last data collection could be due to the uh, high uh, heterogeneity of the sample. And usually it could be uh, more complicated to do the data processing prior again. So I have to rethink the sample preparation of pole one with DNA to obtain a structure of the protein in binding DNA. So, Sorry, last slide, I don't want to miss this. So the last slides I want to acknowledge, uh, I have different people to acknowledge uh, regarding my PhD, but today I will focus uh, more on who were involved more in this part of the cryo uh, analysis. So first I want to also uh, thanks my supervisors and my co-supervisors um, so Dr. Ellen Mo and Professor Maria Armenia, I, of course I want to acknowledge Instruct uh, because uh, accepting my application was really the starting point for being the serious option and strategy to use CryM for determination of Pol1 structure. I want to thank Sara Butcher for receiving me in Helsinki and for, be, for her help and also for uh, thanks her team that were very were really helpful. I want also to thank the support of IMPACT uh, for the internship and also to take part of the workshops. Uh, so I, are, I want to name the coordinators of IMPACT project, Sally Ramon Pietro Matias. I want to thank Celia for uh, helping and pushing also to send my sample to ESRF. So I also have data collection in another um, microscope, Titan Crisis from this uh, center and also thanks Marcus uh, again from Madrid for some sessions for uh, learning uh, Sapien and how to use Sapien for data processing. We have an in-house machine for data processing in the Aeronautic TV from a project from Miguel uh, Asha. I want to thank Josebito for helping me to use Titanius and of course uh, thank you all for your attention. Thank you very much, Andrea. Uh, I have one question here from uh, Margarita Asher. She says yes, she yes. cannot present a question directly, okay. uh, but because, uh, and another from George Freire, but uh, Margarita asked, the, uh, how do you want to improve the resolution of your uh, data collection and sample? And then there is another from George Freire, which I will tell okay. you one by one, probably. Okay, so the first model at 8.2 Armstrongs, uh, it was a really small data collection. The aim is then to obtain a bigger data collection and that way it's important to, uh, of course, have good particles, but a good number of, but also uh, if I, uh, I have select good particles, but the number is uh, um, essential then to have a good distribution and of many particles in different views. And, and this is important then for the 3D reconstruction and to have more information of the different views and different um, um, 
secondary structures of the, the protein. For the sample of the pole one with DNA, I think we, I have really to rethink how to prepare the sample for data collection because heterogeneity could be a problem. Mm -hmm. So the model with uh, uh, 12 hamstrings of resolution, uh, well, uh, it's interesting to compare with the other model, but I, I don't think so far it gives good information. Yeah. Uh, George, George, is that okay, Margarita? Do you want to ask anything else? She's without sound. It's okay, thank you. Okay, good. Now, do you have George Freire who asks, which express, expression system have you selected for protein production? So for this protein, I'm using E. coli and uh, the strain is uh, E. coli pilize S. So E. coli BL21 pilize S. So, well, it's, they are uh, bacterial enzymes, so choice for us to use E. coli. Usually works good for bacterial enzymes. Okay, uh, so, all right, there are no more questions open. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, the, we want to pursue the collaboration with uh, Helsinki, of course, on the, the, the improved data collection in the future. How far do we want to, would you like to, to reach? What kind of level? Of course, the structural level, but uh, uh, in terms of resolution, what do you foresee as feasible? Have you any idea or just? Well, um, with cryo-EM, nowadays, there is more and more structures with uh, better resolution, but I think for Armstrong's, maybe but, uh, considering I mean, cryo-EM, maybe. Yeah, it's could, could you, yeah, yes. Would you like to go to a higher resolution um, center to, to with this apply to access to a higher resolution center to eventually so higher resolution? Maybe, yeah, I had the opportunity to send my sample with the Dr. Sally Rumon that uh, did a proposal to ESRF. So I have a data collection mm -hmm. from another microscope. So in Helsinki, I have used. Uh, Talos article microscope and in the center of RSF, it's Titan Cryos, where the data collection was uh, was at a 300 voltage. So usually uh, gives me uh, better data for for uh, obtaining high resolution structures. So it's more well. I hope you it it's come promising data. Okay. Okay, uh, Andrea, thank you very much. Good luck for the continuation of your work. <clears throat> and now thank we you. will have the last presentation from Hugo Oliveira, the University of Minho, who will tell us about how he won his project, a uh, pilot project in such a competitive um, uh, process. So, yes. Yeah, I don't know whether it was my first time that I applied yeah. and uh, I was happy and honored to have a good feedback. But mm -hmm. I have to say that my background is not structural biology. Uh, I have tra training in microbiology, biology. So it will be a good opportunity to learn about structural biology yeah. to integrate this in my research, of course. Yeah, that, that's the purpose of these instructors to integrate several methodologies and people learn a bit about the other ones. But uh, you please go on. Okay. Can you see my presentation? Yes, yes, it's visible, yeah. Okay. Uh, so, of course, uh, I'd like to thank uh, the organizers for this webinar and the opportunity to, uh, to share this project that has to do with reprogramming bacteriophage tail spikes through a structured guided approach. Uh, this project uh, was financed by Instruct and is expected to run for one year only and it is just started last month. So we are basically uh, finalizing some material acquisitions. We have some uh, data to show, but um, of course this presentation, this talk will be mostly about the aims of the project and uh, how we propose to uh, uh, reach the, these goals. Um, yeah, so my first slide uh, goes for bacteriophages. They are natural bacterial predators. You 
can find them anywhere. In fact, they are the most prevalent biological entity in the world. Uh, so they are um, natural uh, parasites, uh, and this is the typical life, uh, life cycle of these bacteriophages. They need to recognize the bacterial host through receptors. Then they infect the bacterial cell by injecting their DNA. They hijack the protein uh, machinery of the cells to produce their own virus. And then they lyse the cells in the end so that they can release the offspring that can then uh, initiate a new infection cycle. We have been mostly uh, focusing on the first step, the recognition. And here you can see a typical cell structure uh, where you can see uh, most cells have a capsule that is the outermost layer. Uh, but there are other defined structures like uh, lipopolysaccharides, membrane proteins, and a flagella. Uh, and we'd like to, to think that there are three types of phages. One that will never infect the cell because they cannot find the receptor. Others that can pass through the capsule and reach the cell. And the third type that we are more interested in, phages that before reaching the cell, they need to degrade the capsule. And these phages are interesting because they are using proteins, tail spikes, that degrade the capsules. And you can see the different phenotypes on the plate, uh, agar, uh, agar plates. On the left side, you have a phage without these tail spikes, and you only see these uh, phage plaques clear. But phages that typically, typically have these tail spikes that degrade the capsules, they have the phage plate surrounded by a hazy halo. And this haziness is typically associated with tail spikes with capsule activity. So we know that we have this tail spikes, proteins of phages that target capsules. But it's important also to understand that capsules are highly diverse structures. They are produced by uh, uh, clusters with uh, defined uh, conserved genes in their starts and ends and a variable region in the middle. And it's this region that is responsible for the several phenotypes. In, the, in other words, the generation of capsules with different sugars. And this is mostly because they are trying to avoid bacteria uh, phage predation. These capsules help bacteria to hide the phage receptors, but phages are always co-evolving with the hosts, and they are also getting some different tail spikes to target these specific capsule types. So in nature, we have these tail spikes from bacterial phage origin that can specifically target capsule types. We have been working with these proteins for more than five years now. And uh, recently, we, we realized that we were facing uh, proteins, the only pro proteins in nature that can bind bacterial capsules. So uh, we thought that maybe we could use this unique pro property of tail spikes to produce conjugated vaccines. I will try to explain better in the next slides. But the conjugated vaccines are a combination of two elements, protein and capsules. This slide is just to briefly show the different types of vaccines. Uh, on the left, you have the vaccines made of whole cells. Uh, that one can say that is the first generation of vaccines, but still they are used in the national vac vaccination uh, uh, plants. And then the second generation that is more safe, that only uses components of bacteria, only proteins, conjugated or proteins with capsules, or just DNA or RNA. Uh, the purpose of this slide is not to compare the pros and cons of these uh, different vaccines, but to show that we think that these tail spikes could be used to produce conjugated vaccines. And these conjugated vaccines are widely used in children because they promote a long-lasting immunity uh, in children that ha have a, a immature uh, immunity. I will try to uh, explain better this. Here you can see what a conjugated vaccine looks like. It's a combination of two elements. One, it's the capsule of bacteria that by itself cannot trigger the production of antibodies. So we need to couple these capsules with a highly immunogenic protein. And when you 
insert this combination, this conjugated vaccine into a host, we can then immunize uh, the host against a bacteria that has this capsule type. And all licensed vaccines are made through chemical conjugation. So they are combining the capsule, which is a polysaccharide and a protein with the chemical linkages. And as you can see here, this is really complex process because on one hand, we need to express the capsules, we need to grow the host, and then we need to isolate, purify this capsule, sometimes cleave it, purify it again, and then do some chemical activation. We have to do also the same from the, for the highly immunogenic protein. And still in the end, when we need to, we need to make the chemical conjugation, further purification before we have the final conjugated protein, the uh, vaccine that is uh, made of a protein in a capsule. Oh, and of course, this process is uh, time consuming. It's not reproducible because the chemical linkages are not always the same. And because it takes time and some uh, expertise, uh, it is a costly method. So we envision the use of these tail spikes to make an enzymatic conjugation. So instead of chemical linkage, we think that these proteins could be used to link the protein to the capsule because th their natural function is to bind the capsules. And this, of course, will allow the recombinant, uh, the recombinant production of vaccines in a much lower price, in a reproducible way. And of course, there are many steps to achieve that, but this project only aims to modify this tail spike to allow this enzymatic conjugation. Uh, of course, taking advantage of the unique properties of these proteins that are the only proteins in nature, but please uh, correct me if I'm wrong, that binds to bacterial capsules. So this is an overview that uh, what is needed to achieve that, we need to re reprogram tail spikes. I will, I will try to explain why. So we have been cloning and producing these tail spikes for quite some time, and we know already that in the C-terminal sites of these proteins, is where it happens, the capsule recognition. And it will be helpful to have the atomic structure results in our site so that we can modify these proteins. And I didn't, I didn't explain this in detail, but in nature, these tail spikes, they bind to, to the capsule, and, but also degrade. This is how the phage is reaching these cells. So in order to make a, a enzymatic conjugation using these tail spikes, we need to understand how the protein looks like and remove the cleaving part, but maintain the binding activity, of course. And this is how Instruct will, comes into play, because we think that this will be possible with a structural guided approach. So we have been already preparing some tail spikes for a crystallization. Uh, we are expressing these proteins as a recombinant uh, protein in the E. coli system. Of course, we need a high purity, so we need to combine affinity with size exclusion chromatography. Uh, we have all these things uh, in our lab. Uh, of course, we need also to test if the protein is active or not, but this is also well implemented. With just a drop test, we can see that the recombinant tail spike makes this haziness that the phage the wild type phage has, as this image is showing. And then uh, we are doing some quick tests to try to optimize uh, our chances to have crystals uh, out of our tail spikes, uh, trying to understand the solubility limit of tail spikes, concentrating, uh, concentrating our sample. In this particular case that I'm showing here, we know that the, the limit of solubility is around 45 milligrams per, per ml. Um, yeah, and the, these proteins, they are, they are active to uh, micrograms of millimole of uh, ml range. Uh, we also trying to understand their stability because uh, the crystallization itself will not be carried out in the University of Minho, in our center of biological engineering, because we, have, we don't have these equipments. It will be through a, a partner. And uh, if, at a certain stage, we need to send our samples uh, and we need to understand if they are stable, of course. Uh, and we also do this in our center. We can do a circular decoism to measure the secondary structures of our proteins and do some th thermal stress. And we, uh, we see that these proteins are 
remarkably stable because they melt at 60 degrees. Sometimes you have proteins that melt at 90 degrees. Uh, we, we also do some other tests where we uh, freeze our sample because we imagine that maybe we can send our samples in a frozen state. But, and, but we need to understand that after the thawing of our frozen stocks, if the uh, protein are, is active, and yes, this image here also shows that with or without the glycerol, uh, when we freeze our samples after minus 80, they are still active. Of course, we would like to do a liquid nitrogen to freeze our stocks that is less stressed, but still at uh, doing this, uh, the protein is quite active, so it will not be a problem. Uh, yeah, now we are in conversations with the Instruct Center, Yosef, at the Czech Republic. They will do the structural prediction of our proteins, and of course I will be there also. And I've been uh, in constant contact with them. Uh, um, I, like I told, I'm not uh, an expert in uh, structural biology, but uh, I think I know the basics. That, that uh, Of course, the first step will be uh, to... Uh, to, do a, uh, to use a crystallization robot that will screen fastly and with low volumes of sample, the best uh, conditions that, that we can make the crystals out of our tail spikes. And of course, then uh, the structural determination will be through X-ray crystallography that can be complemented with SACS. Uh, after this, we can monitor, monitor the uh, crystallization uh, using uh, uh, crystallization hotels like this one that they have at Viosev. And as I understood, they have a web interface where I can conduct this process uh, remotely here at Portugal. Uh, as a final step, uh, once we have our structure uh, resolved, the atomic structure, we can easily or more easily try to identify, uh, identify the catalytic residues that can then be changed to direct or random mutagenesis. Uh, if we do direct mutagenesis, we will be uh, replacing uh, these catalytic residues by uh, alanine, for example, that is a neutral amino acids. But of course, we can try to locate this active site and do some random mutagenesis. Uh, that could be also uh, quite easy to do here in our lab. And of course, at the, at the end, we will be measuring if our mutated tail spikes will still be active with a drop test, like I showed before. But of course, this would be always complemented with circular decreasing analysis, because we need to understand if the mutated that we inserted is affecting also the structural viability of our protein. So we want, of course, to maintain the structure, but only affect the catalytic uh, parts. And yeah, I think this is it. Uh, of course, again, I would like to acknowledge Instruct uh, for financing this uh, project. Uh, our partners uh, that will be involved, they are already involved uh, to be yourself. And yes, and just this is uh, my final slide to show the Center of Biological Engineering at the University of Nino. And uh, you are all welcome to come and yeah. Happy Hopefully take next project. year. Hopefully next year, but we'll see. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you very much, Hugo, for your presentation. Um, some people have left already, but uh, Margarita Asher is asking: Are you going to instruct center to an instruct center to learn? Let me open the. the are you going to an instruct center to learn structure determination by X-ray crystallography? Or will you send protein sample and then and they will conduct the process? So, uh, do you want to become part-time structural biologist or or, or uh, learn uh, about my, structural my biology? Aim is always to evolve. I don't want to, I don't want to stop. And uh, actually, uh, I budget uh, the, the two travels to that center to be involved and learn everything and eventually reproduce when we have the opportunity in our set. To, uh, and then to help also my colleagues at uh, the center. So yes, of course, I would, I would be involved, I will be there, and I would like to learn anything that I, that I can. Uh, do you plan, for instance, for an internship? Because that could be a, a longer stay better than just access. 
Yes, uh, maybe at longer term. Uh, for, for now, I have one year only. Uh, maybe I don't have time for this uh, project to, to, uh, to apply to a, 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 tra a, a training. So yes, but uh, if uh, I learn and I think I have more opportunity to get more knowledge with the longer stays, yes, I will be, uh, be applying uh, to uh, more funding. I think you can, you, I probably you can combine both things because you can even during the, the project duration you can apply for an internship and uh, and try to get more more involved directly in the in the process. Yeah, I will look for that, of course. Uh, I don't see any more questions. Uh, at least uh, on my screen, I don't. Uh, okay. So we, we now have a key and day session, final session for all the speakers who are still present. Some Carlos has left already, but uh, uh, apologies, but he had to leave. And uh, I don't know if um, there are any more questions that could come from the 44 participants still around uh, that might uh, want to know a bit more about either instruct about the projects or um, how to access the other activities or whatever can come to their minds. Maybe I have one. Uh, yeah. Okay. Because I, I heard that ENL, that is right next to the University of Mio, they have a cryo AM and they will be partnering with instructs also. I don't know if this is already uh, available or if you can use this equipment to instruct. Yeah, yeah well, I, I suppose that Celia is still around, but uh, this is what I presented on my one of my last slides uh, because under this uh, network that was formed, uh, yeah, Celia has a right hand. Uh, I think uh, I yeah. can give her. Okay. Yeah, so yeah. are you listening? Yeah. Uh, so uh, the process in INL, we, we got the, the proposal accepted. So there's a project. We are at the moment um, launching the, the, the call for, ha for buying or for acquiring the microscope. So hopefully uh, the, the goal is to have the microscope installed in the beginning of next year. Uh, and this is a national um, infrastructure, so it will be access to everybody from, from all the country. Um, if we want to see how this is goes, and then obviously we want to connect to Instruct, and that's in our plans. But for the moment, we are just speeding up <laughs> because we want the microscope to, uh, to be uh, installed. So it will be a 200 kV microscope. It will be, hopefully it will be a type of a, a, a glass here. So, uh, so it's a 200 and it, it, uh, it will allow us to do already a lot of things there. So definitely Minho will, is just next, to, next, it's just close to you. So it will be really great. Yeah, and it would be also good that uh, you distribute the information in your center and your university so that people know this about this possibility even uh, now because this will become, uh, we hope, reality not so far distant future. Yeah, that's definitely. And one of the things that, uh, as I said, we are really stressed now to, to have uh, things going on to have the, the, the microscope whenever we have things or when we have an idea, when we'll have the microscope installed, then we will start to, I would say, disseminate um, this project and the infrastructure. That's definitely, that's, that's one of the things that the plan. is planned. Yeah. Very good. Um, well, I don't see any more questions. So if there are no more questions, thank you very much all of you to participate and uh, hope that you have enjoyed the meeting. Although it was not presential, I think it was as good as we could uh, do it and go for it. And 
we hope uh, if, uh, the virus will allow us and the variants which are coming along along will allow us, we will have a, a presidential meeting in University of Minion next year, next uh, late spring as usual. Uh, at the beginning, I said that the last one was, I, I made a mistake, was not, of course, 220, it was 218, as, as Susan well remarked. So there are several messages uh, here. Thank you for the nice and informative meeting. Uh, very good. Anyway, okay. Thanks to the well, well thanks, uh, thanks for the event. And uh, I think uh, I think it was informative. And uh, the main idea is to peep to that people know what are the activities, how they can benefit from Instruct and uh, try to explore them as much as possible. Because I think being a country with uh, fewer resources than the other countries, we should uh, use these, these um, infrastructures and European infrastructures as much as possible and take the most advantage of it. If we will become a cent uh, Instruct site, uh, or uh, um, the best uh, situation too in Portugal, we hope, then uh, this will be a step forward to have a center sometime in the future, especially if we will have cryo EM facilities also in the future. But so we all have to work hard for that. Thank you very much for all and uh, have a rest of a good afternoon and uh, Good week, nice week, and uh, uh, good work, hard work, remote or presential as you might come.